Well, at least they won't forget their graduation Sunday. All right. Now, I did that to them because it's funny and it's fun for us. Um, but, but on a serious note, um, let's jump into it. And guys, everything that I prepared today is for our graduates geared towards them, but, but the truth of it definitely will fit us all. And so if you can, turn your Bibles real quick to Romans chapter 12. And um, I'm going to try to move quickly just because I know we have a lot to do today. So, you still laughing? <laughs> oh man, she loved it. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to read verse 1, a very familiar verse. And Paul says, I, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Or... Um, it, <sighs> This is a common verse, and and here's where I want to start. I want to start and make this a little bit of a foundation for us, okay? Paul says, I appeal to you, I I implore of you, I beg you to develop the mindset, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that you should be living in such a way where your life is a sacrifice to God. And then he says, he says a life that is holy and acceptable to God, which which is worship, which is your your reasonable service, which is um, the reaction you should have to Christ because of what he's done for you. What has he done for you? The Bible says something that amazes me every time I read it. It says that you were bought with a price, and therefore you are not your own. What was that price? The blood of Christ. Guys, you could never do anything, you could never bring anything to God to compare to that sacrifice that Jesus gave for you. But Paul says your reaction should be to live a holy and acceptable to life, a living sacrifice. Now, the question I want to answer for the young, for, for the young people is what does that look like? What does living a life of sacrifice look like to God? And he says it in the verse. In verse 1 he says, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. The way that you can live your life as a living sacrifice to God is by living a life that seeks and pursues holiness and righteousness. And where that starts is with the decisions you make. When you pursue righteousness, when you base your decisions on your mindset, that is, I'm going to please God with my life, I'm going to give Him my life, you make righteous decisions, And your life is a picture of holiness, and it is acceptable to God, and um, that is is what we are supposed to do. Now, inevitably, these guys, I asked them a few minutes ago, what are they planning on doing with their lives? And they had different answers, and we expect that. We know you guys are planning things, but I'm going to push you a little bit this morning, and and I'm going to take you into Scripture a little bit, but I want you to understand this, that if, if during your planning time what you're going to do with your life and the decisions you've made about what steps you want to take, if you have not gone to God with that, if you have not asked Him what He wants you to do, or if He's okay with the decisions you make, you, 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 need, to, you need to be careful. You are in the wrong. And, and I don't mean that harshly at all, because we've all been there. We've all made these decisions without ever asking what God's opinion is. And, and what we do is... I. I, I I wanted to bring up actually like ice cream and make an ice cream sundae for you, but I figured that somebody may run up here and take it from me, or um, because of time, I shouldn't do it. But have you ever have you ever had an ice cream sundae, or you fixed an ice cream sundae and it was just perfect, right? I, I prefer chocolate. And what we do, and, and with our lives, what we do is we get we get our ice cream, our life, and we start we start making plans, we start throwing things together. Um, We put some chocolate syrup on, and that, to me, stands for money, because chocolate syrup is delicious, and we all like money. And we make our plans to build our lives on something that that we believe will get us money. And and so we continue there, and and we throw some caramel on there, caramel, however you want to say it, it doesn't matter to me, And um, because we want want all the nice things in our life. We want the sweet things. We want the the pretty girlfriend or or the right boyfriend. We want the, the good car. You know, we want to be comfortable. 
We want everything to taste good. We put some whipped cream on top because we want everything to be comfortable. We want it to be fluffy. And then we realize, oh, I'm a Christian, and I'm supposed to include God on this. And so we take a cherry and put it on top and say, okay, God, that's you. Now I want you to bless everything that I just did. And God said that's not the way it works. God is not an addendum. He is not something that we add on top of what we've already planned for our lives. He says you're missing something very important. And guys, I want to take us into what Jesus, his reaction was when he faced pressures and when, we, when he had to make important decisions about the way his life was going to go. And, and really, this, the idea of this sermon is on, on following the calling that God has on your life. But, but the two words that stick out to me the most in the passage we're going to read in a second is, I must. Jesus says, I must. And so go to Luke chapter 4. We're going to spend a few minutes here. And, um, Ian, can you throw me that water in my bag right there? I had strep throat about a week and a half ago, and so you can tell <clears throat> my voice is still a little bit, the throat's a little raspy. And this, this really gets good. I mean, I really enjoy this passage, and we're just going to read two, a couple verses. Look in chapter 4 of Luke, verse 42, <clears throat> and it says, And when it was day... He departed, Jesus, and went into a desolate place, and the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. So stop right there. Have you guys ever wanted to be alone? Jesus has been doing some amazing things here. In the, in the leading up to this verse, he has been healing people. People come to him with needs, and he answers them. He does what they ask of him. And it says that he is pressured by the crowds. The people are overwhelming him. And he goes away in a desolate place. In other words, he wants to be alone. He wants to get alone with God. And, and then the people find him. And they come to him and they are, they're not going to let him go. Have you ever wanted to be alone and somebody won't let you be alone? Sometimes we just got to be alone. I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old. And they're both boys. And sometimes I just want to be alone. And the one place in my house that I would expect to be alone in my bathroom, I cannot be alone. <laughs> it does not matter <laughs> what I'm doing in there. If I lock the door, they bang on the door and scream my name until I open it. If I leave it open, they come in. They are not bothered whatsoever by anything with the bathroom. I cannot be, exactly, I cannot be alone. And sometimes it's overwhelming. And Jesus was certainly overwhelmed at this point. And guys, this is the truth I want you to get, okay? And I don't have this as a main point, but, but graduates, young people, everybody, the older, older, we know this. People will always need something from you. They will always need something from you. And as you grow older, you will grow busier. That's just a fact of life. And there will be deadlines, whether it be school or job, you are going to feel the pressures of life. Things are going to overwhelm you. And your reaction must be what Jesus did. And he got alone with God. Sometimes you have to tell people, this is, this is not where God is leading me. And I know that you want me to go this way. I know that you're expecting me to do this, but I can't do it. And that's what Jesus says. Look in verse 43. Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. So Jesus not only says, this is something I have to do, he reminds them that that was the purpose that God had placed on his life, that he had to do that. I must do this. And so I'm going to jump into the points because I do want to move quickly. And, and graduates, young people, I want you to write these things down. And the first one is you need to pursue your calling and not your potential. I told you a minute ago, and I mean this. I'm not joking. God has something specific for you in your life. And if we are not careful, we will get caught up in what the world tells us we can do or what we are potentially able to do. The American dream says you are potentially able to make a lot of money, live a comfortable life, build your own kingdom, not focus on God's kingdom. And you got to understand something. I'm not preaching against money or a nice house or a car that drives, okay? That's not at all what I'm doing. I'm preaching against a mindset that will distract us from the calling of God in our lives. And... Um, 
I, you know, some of you guys have the potential to do great things, and I think you will do great things. But the danger is when we, when we begin to focus on something that we say, in this area I have potential in it, when God may be saying, that's not the direction I want you to go at all. And we have to learn to be okay with that. Because one thing that God has made very clear through Scripture is, is one, that He is always faithful, and two, is that His ways are always better than our ways. And if you look at guys in the New Testament, even Paul, as we just read in Romans chapter 8, um, Paul was, was, was really kind of living the high life, if you would, for a Jew. Um, he knew everything pretty much you could know. He was very smart. He uh, had his hands in a lot of pockets. He was making, I'm sure, good money. He was at the command and, and knew personally some of the guys that were pretty high up in the system. Um, but Jesus came to him and said, that is just not the direction that I want you to go. And, and he had an experience with Jesus, and he changed. And Paul, regardless of what he went through in his life that was damaging to him physically, I guarantee you he would tell you that when he followed the direction God had for him, it was much better than the direction he was going by himself. And so pursue your calling, not your potential. Guys, I, I can tell you right now without a doubt that you are called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not a question you have to ask, God, did you call me to do this? He did call you to do that. The word that Jesus uses here when he says that I must preach, the word is euagalizo, which means I must bring glad tidings of good joy. It is not what I'm doing right now, standing in front of people and presenting God's word. It is the idea of him. He said, everywhere I go, he said, I am called, I am sent to go into these other towns because I must preach to them. And when he says preach, he, mu- he means there is good news, God's kingdom, God has a plan, he is at work, and I have to tell them. These are glad tidings of great joy, and I have to let them know God's plan and what he is doing. And, and guys, you are called to do that. And whatever, wherever you go, wherever God leads you and takes you, that is something you never have to question. You should always be ready and willing to bring glad tidings of great joy because people need to hear the gospel and you're called to do it. Do not, I beg of you, do not abandon that. Do not abandon that. The second thing I want you to to remember is this. There will always be more things you can do than things you should do. And, And some of us know this so well. But God wants to do great things in your life. And guys, Jesus could have stayed right there and he could have done a lot of things. And I've wondered, as I was going through this passage, I've wondered, what if Jesus said, okay, God, I know you sent me for this purpose. I know you called me to this purpose, but I think that this might work out a little bit better. These people obviously need me. They don't want me to leave, so I'm going to stay here and do this. What if Jesus said, I'm going to tap into this divine authority that I have access to because I am the Son of God, and I'm going to spend my ministry years only healing people, only doing what people ask of me, and I'm not going to follow the direction God is ha- that God is leading me, even though I know it's going to lead to the redemption of mankind as we know it. What if he had said, I'm busy doing these things instead of, instead of doing what he clearly says God sent me to do right here? Guys, there will always be more things you can do than you should do. And, and, and we as Christians dangerously need to reprioritize our lives. There are times we are completely distracted and messed up and, and we don't have first things first where they should be. Instead, we have the things that we want first and we put them in front of us and we follow after them and we chase after them instead of after the things that God has for us. Do not get caught up in things that are secondary, things that don't matter. Pursue first things first. There will always be more things you can do. But there are specific things that you should do, that God has called you to do. All right? Third thing. You guys writing this down? Just because you were busy does not mean you were fruitful. What a tragedy it is when believers spend their entire lives building their own kingdom, and they are busy, 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 and they look back over the years of their life and they see no fruit from it. Because one day, you do realize we will stand before Christ. And He will 
Show us our lives and show us the decisions we made, and we will see the fruit or the lack thereof. Guys, don't be so busy that you're not doing anything. (laughs) Don't be so busy that you are fruitless in your walk with Christ. And I want to I want to switch a little bit. There are a few more points I want to give you, but we're going to go to another passage. And I'm moving, okay? I'm moving quickly. So I want you to go to 1 Kings chapter 19 very quickly. And I'm going to read a few few verses for you here. Elijah was the man, okay? Elijah was a prophet of God. He was Man, God used them in some great ways, some powerful ways. And, and, in, and in chapter 18, the chapter before what we're going to read, the, the famous story of Elijah challenging 450 prophets of Baal. And he basically comes to the Israelites, he comes to the people and says, all right, look, you've got to make up your minds. Either follow after God, Jehovah, or follow after Baal, but, but, but none of this stuff in the middle. We're going to decide this today. He kind of draws a line in the sand. And he challenges these men, these, these prophets of Baal. There's 450 of them. And you know the story, most of you. And they build a sacrifice, they build an altar, and he allows the prophets to call on Baal to send down fire and consume the sacrifice. And, and of course, Baal doesn't answer because he's not real. <laughs> um, and the prophets are, they begin cutting themselves, they are dancing, they are completely pagan and worldly and wicked in their ways, and, and, and Baal doesn't answer. Elijah even mocks them. Uh, he's making fun of them. Where, where's your God now? He, is he asleep? That's right. Is he asleep? And so Elijah says, you know what? Pour some water on the sacrifice on the altar and let's, let's see what happens. He calls down. He calls, he calls God to bring fire down from heaven and God does and consumes the, consumes the altar. Just an amazing thing. Would have loved to have seen it. And then Elijah doesn't stop there. He says, the prophets, 450 of them, go kill them. We are going to remove this wickedness, this pagan, this culture, this idolatry. We're going to take it out of our land. We're going to get rid of it. But what's funny is later in the chapter, Elijah's depressed. He's just had this amazing experience with God. Elijah's depressed. He thinks he's going to die. There are people out for him. They want to kill him. He is the last prophet remaining, and and he just sits under a tree and says, God, just end it, you know. And God's like, what are you talking about? Did you just see what happened? God provides for him, and then he says, I want you to go find Elisha. And for those of you who are Star Wars fans, the best uh, correlation I can give you, I guess, is Elijah's like um, Qui-Gon Jinn, and Elisha would be Obi-Wan Kenobi, all right? These guys are awesome. They are prophets of God. They are, they are really cool. And so Elijah goes, and we're going to read it right here in, um, in chapter 19, in verse 19. It says, so Elijah departed from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah, said, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And Elijah said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? And he, Elijah, Elisha, returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen. I love the detail there. And he gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and he went after Elijah and assisted him. Guys, something, there, there's a few things that are really important about Elisha's reaction that I want to share with you. Elisha knew as soon as Elijah cast his cloak upon him, Elisha knew that that meant something. And he knew that God had something for him. But here's the, here's the key. He didn't know what that was yet. And so the thing you can learn from Elisha, and the first thing is this, you don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. Elisha immediately, man, he, he not only, you know, he, he went back, he said bye to his parents, but, but he, he did something that, that I find fascinating. He was just using these oxen to make a living, to provide for himself and his family so they could eat. And he says, I don't need them anymore. And so he killed them. He fed the people with him. He chased after Elijah. And he said, I don't need him anymore because God's called me to something and he's going to provide it. He's going to provide what I need. He's going to take care of me. He would not call me into something specific and then not take care of me. And that's one of the things that we talked about on Wednesday night. The Lord's Prayer. Jesus Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. 
And we talked about how the Israelites in the Old Testament, they were wandering in the wilderness and, and God provided for them and he sent them manna from heaven daily. And when they tried to store it up for the next day, it rotted. Because something that is very important to Christ is that we learn to rely on God daily. He says, I'll take care of the birds. You think I'm not going to take care of you. So if you will follow after God's calling on your life, he promises you that he will provide for you. And Elisha knew that. And Samuel, the prophet Samuel says this, and he says that, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience? He basically says, do you really think that sacrifice is as important as obedience? And Elisha paints a perfect picture here of what obedience is. God says something to him. God says he puts on Elisha's heart, this is what you're supposed to do. And Elisha doesn't question it. He follows after it immediately. He obeys immediately. Guys, obedience is so important for us to learn. And you have been practicing for the last 18, 19, 20 years with your parents. It probably hasn't gone well at times. But God can do great things through an obedient child. And he wants to do great things through you. You do not have to understand fully to obey, to obey immediately. And then the next thing, we just talked a little bit about it, that I want you to write this down. Those that God uses the most hold on to the least. <laughs> Elisha said, I don't need this because God has something else for me. Guys, look at me. Listen to me. There may be some things that you need to let go of today. There are some things that, and, and here's what's important. Listen to me. There was nothing wrong with Elisha providing for himself and his family with the oxen. That was not sinful. He did not have something in his life that was wicked that God said, get rid of. You may have some, some stuff in your life today. It's not sinful in and of itself. It's not wicked. It's not bad. But it may be distracting you from the calling that God has on your life. And if it is, it's got to be let go of. So whatever that is, you, and, and you may know, you may, you may be pursuing something and you do not want to let it go because it has promised you something that you believe it will give you. And it may come through for you eventually. But it will never come through, you, come through for you like Christ can and will. God, those, who, uh, those who hold on to I totally forgot my point. Those that God uses the most, hold on to the least. Be willing. Be willing, just like, like Elisha was, to walk away from some stuff. It may be people. Maybe some friends in your life. We have to be willing to walk away. Because this ties into the living sacrifice. Living a holy and acceptable life to God as a living sacrifice because it is our reasonable service or it is our worship to Him. You are not going to live a life that is a sacrifice to God that is holy and acceptable if you refuse to let go of things that are distracting you from God's will for your life or keeping you separated from His presence in your life. I never said it's easy. I get that, okay? It's not easy. But discovering God's will for your life will come from this. It will come from silence and solitude just like it did for Jesus. His immediate response when He was pressured by the people was He got alone with, he got alone with God. And we have to find solace, uh, we have to find solitude, we have to get alone with God where there are no distractions and we have to say, God, you've got to lead me into this because I don't know what I'm doing, but I will obey you. I am willing to let go of things that I know are pulling me away from you, just like Elisha did, and follow after him. And guess what? Just like the fourth point, you don't have to know all the answers to obey, and you don't have to know where you're going to end up, but God will, God will say, if you will honor me with your life, if you will live holy and acceptable unto me, then you watch where I lead you. And then you're going to look back and say, I didn't even know how I ended up here. I just know that I was obedient. I know that I followed after what God had for me. I know that I listened to his word and I got with him alone daily to see what he wanted from me. And then look where he led me. I want, there's four questions I want you to ask yourself here, okay? For our graduates, our young people mainly, but for, for all of us. First question is, am I allowing God to speak to me through his word in a personal way? Guys, here's what this question implies. You are in his word already. If you are not in God's word, do not expect to discover what God has for you. It doesn't work like that. God speaks to us through his word. He leads us through that. Are you allowing God's word to speak to you in a personal way? Second question Ask yourself this, am I totally surrendered to the will of God? Have I already decided to say yes to Him? If God comes to you and asks 
of you something, or if he wants to lead you a certain direction, or if he wants you to let go of some, thir- some certain things, have you decided that you're going to say yes to him and be obedient? And if you haven't, what's going to happen is you're going to face a battle. You're going to go head to head with God. You may go your own way. It doesn't mean God's going to abandon you, but you may go your own way hard headed. And um, eventually you may say, man, I missed it. I could, I could have gone a different direction. Third question I want you to ask yourself, am I convinced that what God has for me is better than any of my own plans? If you've already decided that you know better than God, then you may be in trouble anyway. Are you convinced that what God has for you is better than what you could do for yourself? And then the last question is, what is it that I am passionate about and sense God's presence when I am doing it? Guys, God has given you specific abilities and talents and gifts, and he wants you to use them for his glory. And if you are using them for your glory or for your kingdom, then um, there's a problem. Here's a serious part of this message. And it's all serious, I know, but this is where really you feel the weight of it. You guys, you graduates, you young people, 15, 20, 25 years, a lot of us are going to be gone. We're going to be gone. The reality is the future of our country, of this church, the future of our world is in your hands. And if you cannot learn now to be obedient and let go of what God is asking you to let go of, this church may not be here. That's the reality of it. This isn't a sermon for me to try to convince you that you need to do something else with your life. This is me bringing before you the fact that God has something for you. And if you don't follow it, you're going to miss out. And whenever someone follows the will of God for their lives, it always has an external impact and it impacts other people. And the vice versa is true. Whenever someone denies the calling of God on their lives, it will always have an impact on the people around them. Do not abandon what God has for you in the name of what you want to do for yourself. Because I get it. I know. I know that the culture tells you that you can do this and do that, and you can. You can. It's your decision. I tell, the, I tell you guys all the time, it's your life. It's your decision. You're going to make the decisions. Your parents can lead you and push you and, and try to help you in one direction, and, and you may listen to them just for the sake of not getting in a fight, but it is your life. And the decisions you make will catch up with you, whether good or bad. That's the reality of it. It's a serious thing. And my heart, I want to see you guys, man, succeed. But I want to see you follow after God because I know. I know that where he can take you, you could never imagine going yourself. And the way that he can provide for you is just absolutely overwhelming. It's overwhelming. So the question is, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing? Where are you going? Let's pray. Father God.